Working? So, ah, great. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next panel, which is on the economy, the environment, energy, and um, it's called climate so, economics. So the last panel focused on the base and the top of a well-functioning society and all of our aspirations security being the necessary precondition for anything to be possible and human rights being our highest aspirations and as one of the panelists was quoting uh, civil rights readers from the 60s I'm reminded of a quote by Martin Luther King let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long but that it bends towards justice now we are going to start off with connecting this these highest aspirations and the base with our topics. And we're going to begin with Shomi Hassan Chaudhary, who is a water sanitation and hygiene activist from Bangladesh, who co-founded a nonprofit Awareness 360 organization, which empowers young people for, from across over 25 countries in advancing the United Nations goals. She's also on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list and a featured honoree and won the Diana Legacy Award for her humanitarian work continuing the legacy of Diana. And I'd like to add a potential future Prime Minister, say, of Bangladesh. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you, what is the importance of water sanitation and hygiene or WASH, and what motivated you to get involved with this in the first place? Thank you, Salko, for the question. I hope I'm audible. Um, hi, everybody. It's truly an honor to be here and to be speaking amidst um, all of these um, people here in this room. Um, why WASH and how did I even become a WASH activist? So um, my passion for WASH actually stemmed from a personal loss. Um, unfortunately, eight years ago in 2014, uh, on the Bengali New Year's Day, I lost my mother to diarrhea. and. Losing my mom to diarrhea within just one day was devastating, but more like it was shocking. I just could not believe that in this day and age, people actually do die from diarrhea. But when I did some research, I found out that hundreds and thousands of people are dying, and my mom is just a very tiny drop in the ocean. And that bothered me, and I really wanted to do something about it, because the pain, obviously, it is a lifelong regret, a lifelong loss that I will carry with me, but I didn't want anybody else to go through the same, which is why four days after my mother's death, I did my first water sanitation and hygiene talk at a storage workers' community. And when I was doing that, that WASH campaign, I, and I was talking about you know, the importance of water, the importance of drinking clean water, sanitation, hand washing, etc. I realized the power of incredible, the incredible power of storytelling. Um, just how I was moved by the performance yesterday, the, the Truth to Power performance, where we heard about different stories and we could really put ourselves in their shoes, right? And that is sort of what I saw that it, this could be incredibly impactful, which is really what motivated me to become a WASH activist. And a few months later, I co-founded uh, Awareness 360, which is. Um, a global youth-led nonprofit that now works across um, 25 plus countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe, raising awareness about water sanitation and hygiene. Now, why does WASH matter? Um, it, is, it is quite bizarre to me that we still have to talk about the importance of something as basic as water sanitation and hygiene, because we just, we are going through COVID-19 pandemic even till now, and we have seen the, um, the, the criticality of WASH during this pandemic because it has really been a prerequisite to combating COVID-19. But one of my concerns is also that after we are done with COVID, maybe people, the best practices that we have gotten uh, through the pandemic, we will probably go back to normal, which was not really the right normal, because whether there is a pandemic or not, we should continue to wash our hands because wash can you know, um, save you from so many different kinds of diseases and all of these diseases are preventable. Um, if we even talk about the neglected tropical diseases, almost all of the neglected tropical diseases are um, preventable or uh, can, we can make a better effort in preventing them from happening uh, to people if there is better wash facility in place. And some of the neglected tropical diseases even, um, 
even uh, lead to uh, permanent disability. And for, for someone with permanent disability, it, it, life is already very hard, and it is even harder when there is a lack of wash facility. And as I was working in the wash space, I have noticed how we tend to um, work in silos, but wash is so much relevant to the environment, to the climate change, to uh, quality education, to uh, you know, the, to the economy. So um, I think it's really important that we, all of these different sectors, we collaborate and we really see the macro picture. We zoom out and see holistically how WASH can be integrated and incorporated into different other uh, sectors as, as we work into it. So for example, um, right now as I'm speaking here, um, back in my home country, Bangladesh, which is one of the most vulnerable, climate vulnerable countries in the world, um, in a place called Silit, uh, it, it's completely submerged underwater there's a severe flood. And, uh, you know, these are, and if there is over uh, drainage, if there is um, a flood in a place, then uh, the, the water quality, the access to safe drinking water becomes an issue. When there is, you know, drought, then there is a lack of um, access to water. So environment and water, water is not just, wash is not just an, a health issue, it is also relevant to the environment very much. So I think it's really important that we look into these things and increase our investment in wash sector as we move forward in a post-COVID world. Thank you. Now, that was very well put. I was also curious, would you have any reasons why wash would be also economically good for a country? Why does it make sense to invest in WASH? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, one, of the, one of the mistakes that we make often is we think of WASH as just a health issue, that it will you know, make you less sick, it will, it will, you will not die early, for example. But it is so much more than that, and it is, it is um, the, the economic impact of investment, uh, the return on investment in WASH is, is huge. Um, as a matter of fact, in a, in, a, in a report, it has been proved by research that the return is in fact fourfold. Um, how? Because you know, when, you're, when a country invests in its wa water sanitation and hygiene space, um, the, there will be less, there will be reduced healthcare costs, there will be, you know, the, the nation as a whole would be more productive. And, and as I was saying in my earlier contribution, how you know, WASH is relevant to education and so many other spaces. Um, for example, um, even I've seen that patriarchy is, uh, is, is very much embedded in the wash space. For example, if a community doesn't have access to water, it, it is usually the girls and women of their community who are tasked to fetch water walking miles after miles. And during that time, um, you know, they're also exposed to um, a different um, a risk of sexual violence even or, or rape. And they could have used that time into uh, other, pursuing other growth opportunities to go to school, to go to work, because there is lack of menstrual hygiene facility in, in schools, girls drop out of schools. Um, so all of these things are so much intricate interlinked. So when we are investing in WASH, it is not just being translated to, um, you know, um, better health of, of the nation, but also in terms of economy, because um, we can see more people will, you know, miss out less work days, more people will reach out to schools and access education. So the impact is, there is short-term impact, but there is also a huge long-term impact, which is, um, which is very much uh, intersectoral. Okay. Well, that was... Very, very interesting. Now, staying on the topic of resources as the uh, building blocks of a well-functioning society, I would now like to turn to Errol Nadir, who is a business developer in the oil and gas industry and is currently the VP of the Young Professionals Branch of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists in the United Kingdom. So, pet oil and gas geology, you could be the next Minister of Oil and Gas in Azerbaijan. Um, so for you, I have the question. We talked about renewable energy on this, during this conference, conference and its importance. Now, could you talk about the importance of this transition and specifically the importance of it for oil and gas rich countries? Thank you. Thank you, Salko. Good evening, everyone. So I would like to start with a short preamble. So. I'm a third generation petroleum geoscientist. My father is a petroleum geoscientist, as was his father before him. But I'm not sure that my children would want to become petroleum geoscientists. And I would like to address the question of why early, and early is the key word here, why early transition to the renewable means of energy production are, more, are important, especially for the countries that are the major oil and gas exporters. 
So I would like to point out four theses, uh, and I would like to look at them from different directions. So from the perspective of economy, uh, technology, environment, as well as international relations. So let's start with the first one, which is the economy. So let's say we have a country that is abundant in hydrocarbon resources, and it has ad adopted the technologies of renewable energy production, and it would fulfill all its domestic needs of the energy. Therefore, it would have a lot of oil and gas uh, remaining, and that could all go into exports. Right? And that would work if they would be one of the first countries to actually have this transition because other countries would still have this demand of the hydrocarbon resources. Now they can sell the crude oil or they can even invest into refineries uh, and then sell the refined petroleum products which would give, uh, bring even more revenues and increase the country's budget. So this, the, this uh, gradual transition would allow for more time to educate young professionals, and it will give them time to learn new technologies that would be applicable for this renewable system. That would mean that we, we have a slow transition from an existing industry, which is an oil and gas, to a newer one, and we would have more workplaces, which would increase the gross domestic product of the country. Now, the technology is, of course, it's quite popular these days, but it would be very important to use artificial intelligence in uh, renewable energy as well. So AI would allow for an effective production of energy. It would allow us to locate areas where we can place the solar panels, the wind turbines, and even predict uh, the time where uh, we should start uh, the, the time for their maintenance, right? And this will be a very optimizing process if we'll be using the right technologies. Now, when these policies are implemented by the government, we should start thinking of uh, what we can do as people. You know, we should be acting as well on this. And that would be trying to stop using the, the cars, the normal vehicles that run on petroleum right now, and instead use the electrical vehicles. And what the government can do, and some of the governments have already implemented that, is to decrease the tax for hybrid cars that are using both uh, petroleum and energy, electrical energy to run it. Uh, so that, that is already a great leap forward. At the same time, uh, public transports could have uh, be free or decreased in price. Now this is very individual for uh, each of the country because some countries have very expensive public transports whereas others would have a cheaper public transport. So each country should decide for them uh, depending on the situation. And from the perspective, perspective of international relations, now EU has adopted a carbon border tax. So that is something that um, the EU importers and non-EU producers would have to pay additionally per each metric ton of carbon dioxide produced, uh, emitted during a production of any, any goods, essentially. So by 2026, uh, this additional tax would make 70 euros per metric ton, and it is expected that it will rise up to 100 euros. Uh, by 2030. Now, what does that mean for countries that are exporting uh, the, the, these goods? So, it would increase the public ta taxation of these countries, meaning it would increase the discontent of the public, and it will increase the risk of social instability, which is a, uh, a very great factor and a risk for any government. So, the question that we should be asking ourselves what should we be doing in the meantime? Okay, those are very good points that you raised there. And my question for you would be like, how do you, how to not, when we're doing this transition, how do you not give up one industry while we're transitioning and how to make that as smooth as possible? Yeah, right. Well, that, that's, that is a great point. So the, the key aspect here is to make this transition, uh, so it has to be gradual and smooth. So we should think of the technologies that were smooth in this process. And I believe that the, question, uh, the answer lies in energy efficiency technologies. So, and this is something simple that already exists. So an example of such would be using LED lamps versus the existing fluorescent lamps. Yeah, so the government can increase the taxes for using fluorescent lamps or maybe ban it altogether. Another example would be to use or invest into companies that are um, building doors, windows, and roofs. 
So if they do it of higher quality, we would actually conserve a lot of heat inside households, industrial buildings, and transports. So during this area, sorry, during this period of transition, uh, before we have new sources of energy, why don't we try to just conserve the energy that we are having now? And that would be a great solution, I think, during that transition. And I think the, one of the challenges to the global order right now, which is the, the topic of our forum, is to actually provide this smooth transition and prevent decrease in the quality of life of the people. I thank you and I thank you for your attention. Beautiful. Now we're going to move on to Sabine Vaivodisha, who works in the Ministry of Defense in Latvia and, also, and whose interests also lie in uh, clean energy and sustainability. So from what I understood, we've still not decided which ministry you're going to be a part of in the future, uh, like the head off. So one of the things we talked about is the need to move from a linear economy to a circular one. And could you potentially give us examples of how you are implementing the circular economy in Latvia? Thank you, Solko. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to be a participant in this forum. It was an honor to be here and listen so many speakers and so many excellencies. As well, to meet an incre incredible young leaders, uh, which I hope we will get and be connected in the future as well. Uh, the forum covered a lot of topics, including an environmental part, and talked about the renewable energy, which was covered as well for my colleague uh, Errol. So I would like to continue uh, this topic, emphasizing on sustainability, especially on the use of the resources and how we can see it in the future. And as a young uh, person, how we would like to see the companies implement their policies and think about how uh, they are affecting the environment. So we all are aware of the fact that the world runs out of the resources and consumes much more than planet can sustain. The linear approach of produce, use and dispose module is not suitable anymore for us. That's why the world is going for new module, circular economy, uh, where we will try to reduce uh, resources, minimizing the raw materials used in the production and try to use more recycled uh, products. Um, there are several business models which we already can see companies are applying in their policies as uh, there are several of them, for example, deposit systems. Uh, for our example in Latvia, this year we started the deposit system and we can see already how interactive society is. Uh, for example, looking at my friends, when the deposit, deposit system started in Latvia, I can see how much they are taking care of the bottles. They are not throwing it just to the waste, but they are uh, taking them in the bag and afterwards going to this deposit uh, box and putting in them in. So this is already a very nice approach how companies and the government is trying to help um, with the recycling. There is a couple more other uh, methods that businesses are, willing, are trying to apply. For example, producing products that can be integrated in fully recyclable loop or by degradable processes. And there is a lot of large companies that are feeling responsible for this matter to be, in, to be involved in, um, in, in this process. So it's very important, as I mentioned, for the young people that we see that a lot of companies are trying to put the effort in helping the planet out and trying to use recycled materials. Uh, of course, there is another model as repair, when a manufacturer and retailer is offered to repair the product. And here, I believe that in the future, there will be the possibility for the companies to not only to buy their products, but to lease them to 
uh, the society in order for them to cover their products back, recycle and make the new products. But to keep it short, the main uh, purpose I wanted to emphasize this topic is for us to think and uh, to think a bit more about the recycling ourselves, how we can stop the waste, not only like thinking or consumer behaviors, what we are buying, do we really need to buy this thing or is this just our willingness to have more, uh, more new things, as well as it is important for the government to understand and to pass a law for the manufacturers to, to uh, understand and have a responsibility that they cannot uh, throw away a new, uh, a new uh, unsold items just because they are not up to date anymore or were not attractive to the society. So the manufacturers will have to think how they can recycle, repair, or produce new products from the old one. And I think it's very important for, for the society and for the government to take care of uh, is to educate people even more. I think the Europe is a very nice example how other countries uh, can take as, a, as an example to educate society, to put the more effort for our understanding how to recycle, what does it mean for the companies to take responsibilities, and what kind of ways there is for society itself to help out in, in uh, recycling methods. And of course, improve waste collection. We can see a lot of young startup companies who are willing to clean the ocean, willing to clean the earth. And I think it's very inspiring. And uh, I hope that a lot of young people who are, who are willing to be enthusiasts in this field will, uh, will uh, I'm sorry, uh, will keep uh, be active in this and talk uh, with our family members with the older one generation who are still trying to understand how to use it and try to um, use technologies as the advantage to uh, to clean the environment and and uh, create a better world for the future uh, i think i will end in this point thank you <laughs> thank you Okay, those are some very interesting examples raised, and now we're going to move on to climate change policy with Dr. Zahir Alam, who is the chairperson of the National Youth Environment Council in his home country of Mauritius, advises the Prime Minister on youth and environment matters, is the author of over 110 peer-reviewed publications, and has written eight books on the subject of smart, sustainable, and future cities. With this background, uh, I think you might consider the PM position of Mauritius in the near-term future. Um, so what captivates your attention on global climate discourses and keeps you up at night? Thank you, Asalko. Thank you, Asalko. I slept very well at night yesterday, so thanks <laughs> for the concern. Uh, to respond to your question, I'd like to maybe bring three points to the audience. <clears throat> the first one about climate justice. I come from a small and developing state of Mauritius, which is just a small tiny dot in the middle of, of the Indian Ocean. We are so small that even in some world maps we're not present. And uh, looking at us for small and developing states in the African continent in particular, uh, I can't stop looking at it from a justice perspective, especially from a post-colonial landscape because the entire small and developing states comprising of 58 countries contributes on only 0.2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Africa, 54 countries, contributes 3.7%. So we contribute the least to carbon emissions, but suffer the most. How is this correct? It's not equitable at all, and it's very unfair. So I think now moving forward, when we talk about sustainability, we really need to talk about justice. How do we repair the wrongs that have been done on the name of colonial empires? And also, how do we move, move wealth to those very well-deserved areas? Because we can't talk about doing sustainable development or globally 
while those countries are still suffering from the scars of, of wrongdoings for a long time, and they still suffer up to today through shattered governance structures. And it is urgent, and it is of utmost of our responsibility to address those. And uh, coming to, to climate funding, I, I won't speak about the need for 100 billion, which was pledged in 2015, but is yet to be actualized. And some reports say that this 100 billion that was pledged for the Paris Agreement will only actualize next year for COP27 in, um, in, in Egypt. So seven years after, so leaders are still talking and talking about, about helping for loss and damage. And I think this will, will keep going on for a long time. But I think it's extremely important to talk about how to empower local communities uh, in former developing states in Africa in particular for them to develop their own solutions for their own problems, to so contextualize the solutions. Because uh, when we talk about, for example, green technology, green technology today comes at a higher price. There's a green premium. The, the extra in price is a green premium. And now with the war happening in, 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 in Ukraine, uh, affecting the price of commodities, for example, the price of inox as a, matter, as a metal commodity increased 80%. In Mauritius, since the war started, the price of petrol increased four times. And now, as a personal anecdote, I was telling you this morning, Salko, I am starting the construction of my house this year in Mauritius. I started the plans in December. I finished in June. By the time I finished, it was already unaffordable for me. So I find it extremely strange that for a war happening 8,000 kilometers away, I'm being unable to afford my own home. So I think this idea of sustainability, of inclusivity, needs to be addressed in different territories as well. And for the idea of green premiums, we need to uh, incentivize tailor-made fiscal mechanisms so that we can encourage private sector involvement within the public domain. I know for many territories, especially for the Western world, when you talk about the private sector, people are like very careful because it's a very taboo subject. But for us, from the small island developing states, from Africa, we don't have uh, finance. So how do we engage in those large-scale projects if we don't engage with the private sector. And I think we have a very different relationship with those entities. And I would like to also approach your, uh, your interest on cities, which is my passion. And I think talking about mechanisms for sustainable development, we have to look at cities. Cities is extremely interesting because as Aaron was talking about energy, in fact, cities globally consume 78% of, uh, of world energy. And they are responsible to 60% of greenhouse gas emissions. And why cities is such interesting to speak about? Because today, 54% of the world is urbanized. And this number is set to increase to 68% by 2050. That's not far away. And in that increase, 90% of that increase will happen in Asia and Africa. Again, Africa. So how do we channel sustainable development in those areas? And it's extremely important because now we see the rise of mega cities, meaning cities of more than 10 million people. So how do we lead to those inclusive aspects in cities if we don't help them to tailor-made solutions, tailor-made fiscal mechanisms so they can regenerate the fabric inclusively? And I think I stress on the word inclusive because when we talk about SDG 11, which is about rendering sustainable communities, it's not only about sustainability, planting some trees here and there and rooftops, no. SDG 11 about inclusivity, it is about safety, resilience, and loss, sustainability. So really, we can't address sustainability if we don't talk about peace. We can't address sustainability if we don't talk about equity, inclusivity, and so on. And uh, I would maybe stop here, but before, I would, when we talk about channeling wealth on, uh, equitably from the global north to the global south, I think Maybe one recommendation would be if we could expand the global carbon credits beyond Europe. Europe has a very efficient uh, carbon credit structure, which is called the Emissions Trading Scheme. But again, it's only about Europe. So it's about channeling wealth within the European region. And I think it's extremely topical about expanding it to other territories as well. And if we can sustainably regenerate cities, not only for climate neutral cities in the global south, but also generate cities which are net positive, so turning those cities into carbon sinks, then I think will be extremely interesting, tapping into those wealth and returning back to the community by absorbing those carbon. 
And I think this is a very topical discourse which we can have in the next few years. Thank, uh -huh. you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've talked about public policy, uh, starting grassroots activism, and now we're going to go from the public sector to the other side with our last speaker, who is Iva Matasic from Croatia, and who is a business person since the age of 20 when she founded her first company in the computer technology background a bit earlier than me, when I say you're a head starter, and who currently owns an investment company focused on the Balkans, which tells me that I might have a bright future. <laughs> like Alchemy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's always good to end close to home, and I'd like to ask you, so from your perspective as an entrepreneur and now an investor, what can states do to create a more suitable environment for investment and entrepreneurship. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Salko. And uh, I'm very, first of all, honored to be here. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, amazing forum and uh, share the knowledge uh, with uh, all the participants and especially with the young leaders who are here to uh, change the approach that we are having nowadays. Uh, as you said, uh, we are neighbor countries and I usually say home is where the heart is and this brings me to the moment when I uh, established my first company. Uh, it was in Croatia. I decided after that to go to the US uh, to see how is to live in the capitalism society. And uh, after that experience, uh, I decided to move again to Croatia, to the Balkan and be there and make things from the side of the knowledge that was gathered. Uh, from the side of the investments and from the side what we talked uh, today with uh, all these different topics, uh, I can say that uh, I will comment from the side of the one that is investing in the companies that are early established, usually startups in the background of the computer technology. And also from the side uh, when other colleagues uh, wish to have co-investments together, uh, what are their strugglings and how usually uh, they approach to these problems. Uh, since I'm from Croatia, I will give first example from the Balkan and what was good uh, that was done and what we can make from the side of the experience. Uh, around uh, 15 years ago, in Bulgaria was established one very interesting cluster that had the name uh, Balkan Black Sea Cluster. In the beginning, it was just initiative of the few uh, people who were really eager to make a computer technology strong on the market. In the end, uh, it started to be under one umbrella, a very prominent association that was uh, recognized in other parts of the globe. Uh, why I'm saying this example? Because after all, we uh, talked about uh, during the coffee breaks and during the panels, I see that also as a state, uh, we need to think uh, like companies and we need to be very clear in the strategies uh, what each uh, country uh, wish to have and in what way wish to have, uh, to have much better overview uh, what is direction not only for next year but for the next five to ten years. What Zahar very nicely said that uh, wealth needs to be focused, yes, but we need to know how to focus and when to focus. And when we are coming to that moment, it will be very good to have uh, clear information from the side of the strategy. On the other side, we are talking a lot about business to business, but what I before business to business see is to have state to state projects. Uh, that uh, we approach to the things that are really important uh, from the perspective of uh, understanding uh, how we can make uh, better choices. And um, interesting experience, uh, again, from the Balkan. Uh, it was a very nice panel uh, organized yesterday about the situation on the Balkan, and we were talking about different things that are happening and that are, let's say, a little bit vibrant. And then my question goes in direction why are we all from the Balkan when we are going from the Balkan, let's say if we met in the Australia or US, I'm now even considering for example Italy, uh, have the best communities, have the best collaboration, why we need to go abroad to make the same things that sometimes we are struggling in the regions we are coming from. 
And uh, from the perspective of uh, the young leaders, what I really can say from the side of the computer technologies and from the side of investments is uh, let's uh, put the brains together and let's see what can be done uh, from the mistakes we made because as being a young entrepreneur, you always need to have a new choices, new decision making and it's also especially hard nowadays uh, when things that were normal are definitely changing. Uh, so let's gather the experience uh, and the energy that is present and make the good things together. Thank you. Absolutely, those were pretty cool points. And I must say, like, for me, when I got to the U.S., like, there was a much bigger spirit of cooperation for all of us from the Balkans and a lot more community building there. So that is definitely an experience that I felt too. So now I'm going to hand it over to the audience if you have any questions or comments whatsoever. Hello, I start with my congratulations. Uh, all of you are incredible in not only your knowledge, but your speaking, your experience. Uh, you hear all the time, it gives us all adults uh, tremendous gratification for the future to see you, but it's just so true. So I thank you for that. Uh, I have a question for all of you, and it's because of your leadership and experience that you already have. Um, you've rightly Salko, asked questions of, or, or sought from them what would you might be the future minister yeah. of this or that but tell us truly with the experience that you have if you could envision yourself and imagine you can do anything because i promise you you can just listening to you you can do anything imagine that you could be 15 years from now where would you be in what sector leading what and and guiding us to what anybody who wants to answer so. Okay, do you want to start with? Well, I yeah. Yeah, you can start. Uh, we are talking about 15 years from now. <laughs> okay, uh, I definitely see myself uh, to having foundation uh, that is supporting all these activities that we mentioned on these uh, panels, especially from the side of the young leaders and uh, each of these foundations that is supporting uh, these activities. To make things better and uh, to have a uh, good communication uh, with the policy making and the businesses because business really wants to support the activities of the state. It just needed to be clear what we need to support. Uh, for me, I think if uh, you would offer me the position of executive director of UN Habitat, I wouldn't refuse <laughs> because I think it's extremely interesting because being there and interestingly, it's based in Nairobi, so being part of Africa, and they are very, very involved in African policies. I think it's a very, very exciting place to be. It will be driving urban policy at, at a global scale. Sure. Um, thank you for the question, ma'am. Um, I definitely see myself uh, somewhere leading in, in, in a leading position in the water, sanitation and hygiene space of my country. And uh, what I would do is, as I was saying earlier, that it is so important to see WASH um, as not only a health issue, but so much more. So I think I will definitely focus on collaboration with others, other sectors, uh, with all stakeholders. Um, plus, I would also focus on a proper uh, monitoring framework. Um, because I think it's so important to, to track our, our action and, and really see whether we are making impact on the ground or not. So that is something I'll definitely highly focus on. Thank you. Errol, do you want Thank you. Thank you for your question as well. So I think 15 years from now, that's quite a long period. And I would like to spend it all on self-development and self-growth. So I think what's important for us as young leaders is to get a very broad and integrated uh, set of skills uh, that well, God knows where that will bring us in 15 years time. So I think both public and private sectors uh, trying something on our own as a uh, maybe a company, uh, being an executive, try ourselves in those roles. And I think we shouldn't be forgetting about volunteering activities as well, uh, to bring people together, to share the common values, and to bring awareness, especially in the energy sector, as I was mentioning in my earlier speech, which is very important that we do some actions right now. Thank you. 
So I'm the last one. Oh no, Soko, you will be as well. Uh, Madam, thank you for the question. The 15 years, of course, is a quite long period to plan further. But um, I really hope that in 15 years, um, I will have my own NGO who will be covering the recycling park, uh, parts and uh, be responsible for trying to recycle um, at the moment what, what already has been done to the world and trying to make the world a better place. But as well, I would like to have my own company, which, is, uh, which will be focused on the products which are eco-friendly as well as gluten-free because in Latvia it's still something new and we are trying to develop it. So the food which will be, uh, first of all, made by clean energy. Uh, first, and the second thing is to be um, suitable for all kind of people with other diseases. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I can. I can go as well. At the end. Um, I'm going to be honest. Unlike all of you, I'm a bit more confused about my future, and uh, like things are. It's very hard to predict the future. So the best way might be to create it. And I'm not sure what I'll do. But I'll say this. I hope that potentially in you know 15 -ish years times, hearing all of these responses, I might get to moderate another panel with these five people. Very. Very exciting. May I Ismail. ask you, thank you. I, I, uh, it's a question also for all the panelists, previous and current. Does anybody feel like founding a political party, joining it? I mean, we've been talking about the, the, the uh, distrust of politics, the abandonment of democracy, and so on. And I'm just intrigued that none of you mentioned sort of the idea of, uh, you know, I'm going to found a political party that expresses the values that I believe in, and uh, I will gradually take over the decision making for my country and uh, maybe uh, reach the top job as well. And uh, 15 years isn't uh, that long. <laughs> well, any comments on that? So, should I start with? To, I'm sorry, I think we will not have a choice to create a party. As a young leader, someone will need to replace, uh, at the moment, uh, those who are in the politicians. And I think uh, in Latvia, there are quite a lot of young people who are interested in politics. And I hope, maybe me as well, will be in a political party. And uh, I really hope that my colleague Anit will definitely be the one of the founders. So I really hope that, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe you show me. Do you want to go ahead with this? I sort of put you on the spot with the prime well, minister thing. <laughs> uh, well, I I think it's not always necessary to to invent something. We can also innovate, and uh, uh, you know, based on what we already have. So um, I I haven't thought about it, but um, now that I'm thinking about it, I think we can still work on what we already have. Uh, not necessarily we have to create something completely new. Okay, fair enough. Would you like to say something? It's a very interesting thought, and I think I would agree with Shomi because before doing in work in policy, I was an activist, and I was fighting against coal-fired power plant. We did the hunger strike. We sued the political party in power. We sued the state and Supreme Court, and we, and we won after two years doing it without a salary. And it was at the time that the time was a youth to, to change things without being in in any political party. But I think if we do want to make sustained change, it, it is at that level that we will realistically do, thing, do things and to really leave a legacy where we can leave the world better for, for a future generation. But then it's very, very challenging because in many different political landscapes, we see usually the same people in power. If we talk about, for example, many of um, countries in, in my geography, and then we see that youth is being utilized as a means to gather votes, but then the control of the party remains very close-minded. Then it becomes very difficult for the youth to fight within the internal structures to really do meaningful change. And I think it is there that the biggest fight will, will happen and we, need, we will need to implode those internal structures. But I think this will take time. I would like to say maybe we don't have enough 
experience and knowledge on what the whole process looks like. And that is where you come in with your years of experience and advice, and you, can, you should teach us how to do these things, whether how these things are possible, what we need to do these things. And it's only after that that I think we'll be able to answer your question fully. Are there any final comments or questions? If not, oh, if not, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you.